if I listen to uh, people around the world, we have a common understanding apart from a few ones that uh, we are in a situation where the earth gets warmer by a small amount, still a small amount. However, that the acceleration, that means the annual increase is much, much higher than what we have seen in the history of Earth as far as we know today. And no one questions that. So what we are questioning or what we are discussing is what is necessary in order to limit this uh, situation or this tendency. And uh, we do not have a common understanding what the best possible ceiling might still be achievable today. That makes the whole discussion difficult. But I am not an expert uh, to make a judgment. This is a better way uh, than another. I take the facts. The facts are we see a rapidly, rapidly in terms of uh, clim uh, climatic uh, changes that we have seen in Earth history. We see this changing uh, rapidly. And if we don't do anything at all about it, we do not know where the ceiling will be. That is, uh, that is all I know. And if we want to limit this to a value that we consider to be appropriate, and no one knows what that is, no one knows whether one degree, which we have already achieved, or one and a half, or two, or maybe three degrees, is, uh, is still something uh, that is sufficient. What does sufficient mean in that context? We simply do not know. We have started an experiment that is a given. What the outcome of that will be, we cannot tell today. This is for me very difficult to judge uh, what an individual technology may be able to do or not. I look at it from a uh, uh, slightly different angle. In about a hundred years from today, one could say in 80 years from today, I, I look at the year 2100, we will have 10 billion people living on this planet. This is what uh, the studies say, uh, uh, on which most of them at least agree. There will be a peak in, in 2060, roughly, where we will be maybe even 12 billion, but somehow we will level off at uh, 10 billion. And that will be a steady state as far as we judge today. So the key question is, these 10 billion people in 80 years from today, they need to breathe, they need to have clean water, they need to have shelter and a decent living. Not only in Europe or the United States, but in Africa and in Asia. And we also know that in order to achieve a situation where everyone has a decent living, we need to produce roughly three kilowatt of energy per person. And that is a lot, and it is significantly more than we are producing today worldwide. Worldwide, we produce and consume this energy, however, mainly in the so-called industrialized world, in the United States, in Europe. To put that in numbers, it's eight kilowatts in the United States, more than four in Europe. In Africa, it is half. In Asia, it is just above one. So you see where the gap is. The gap is not in, on our side of the planet. And the key question is, how can we produce this energy in a way which, where we do not use our atmosphere as a deposit for gases that harm uh, our life? Which means essentially carbon-free. And uh, I know of only two sources uh, of energy that can provide that. Uh, the first one is solar power. And the other one is nuclear power. Now, nuclear power is in Germany 
not accepted from a political point of view. However, in other parts of this world, power plants, nuclear power plants are being built. So that is an attempt, whether it is a good one or not, is a different question, to avoid energy production based on burning of fossil fuels. And I personally favor solar power energy and what is uh, known in Germany as renewable energies uh, like wind is nothing else than solar power because the winds are powered by the sun in the end. And uh, however, I firmly believe that solar power stations in Earth orbit will play a major role in providing this energy uh, to the people on our planet. And uh, my best witness are the Chinese. They are so far the only ones and therefore the first ones who plan a solar power station right now and their plan is to have it operating and delivering service to cities in China as of 2050. That is what I call really foresight. The energy supply in a hundred years or let's say in the year 2100 will be a mix and I don't know what that mix will be. Um, I am convinced though that a substantial portion of that will be uh, produced by solar power stations in uh, by power stations orbiting the earth because there you get the power source that provides in the end every energy that we are using on earth and from there you can uh, direct it with technologies that we do not have yet but that we are going to develop to the places where they are needed because it is not helpful to have the energy all produced uh, let's say in Europe but you need it in, in China or in Africa, in Asia or in Africa. So uh, some say it can be up to 60% which I find a little bit uh, optimistic. Uh, other studies say it's only 16%. I see it on a slightly somewhere in between. But it will be a mix uh, between other sorts of energy where we uh, use wind and there are other interesting concepts uh, how to use the resources that Earth provides us naturally um, to this energy mix. I do not know what it will be in the end. Uh, very often I uh, hear well, we have only one Earth and we, uh, we should uh, restrain ourselves uh, because we are overusing the resources and if we continue like we are continuing, it, uh, we would need uh, free Earths uh, in the year 2050. Now, these numbers sound very frightening, but if you look at them where they are coming from, uh, it's mostly um, an emotional judgment on some singular aspects that are put together and things are a little bit more complex. It is a fact that we are um, a little bit almost stupid. If we look at the food that we need in Europe, we produce much, much, for th much, much food than we need and the rest we waste. So. We produce many things where we waste them afterwards. So it's needless production. It's, a, it's uh, a needless use of energy. So we need to be, uh, we need to learn uh, to be smarter.